you. Um, uh, sorry not to be there. Uh, lucky even to be here. Um, trying to, to find my way. I've pre-cooked my triangle. It's slightly, slightly skewed compared to the way people usually draw Pascal's triangle. Uh, but I've got these vertical blue lines and these diagonal red lines. And the game is to count the paths downward from the root to each of the points, each of the intersections in, in the triangle. So of course, if you're at the root, there's only one way we can get to the root. I can get to here by going down. I can get to here by going diagonally. I can get to here only by going down. But here, I can arrive either diagonally or vertically. And here, I can arrive only diagonally. So you can see what we're actually doing when we're adding two entries from the previous row to get an entry on the next row is counting paths. Familiar stuff. Uh, that's a one, twenty, fifteen, six, and one. And of course, uh, you should understand that this is going to be typical type theorist propaganda, where the slogan is to cross out NAT and write type instead. Uh, so what's going on is that we have some things in blue, it's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we are selecting some of them. Every time we choose a red path, we are choosing to select something. Every time we go vertically downwards, we're choosing not uh, to select something. So here we've chosen one thing, two things, three things, four things, five things, all six things. So, we can think of our types. Let me get the colors right. From M things choose N as the type of paths that get us from zero, zero to MN in this diagram. And what is such a path? It's, uh, well, in particular, it's a, a mixture of blue edges and red edges where the type is counting the red edges. You could almost encode the blue edges uh, by zero and the red edges by one and observe that what we've actually got is a type of bit vectors in the uh, indexed by a length m and a population count n, not merely counting the ways to select n things from m, but actually representing a particular choice of the n things. Okay, let's just remind ourselves how this how we might define this thing recursively. So we could say we've got some base cases that uh, there, there's one way to choose zero things from M things. And 
there are no ways to choose n plus one things from zero things. And otherwise, if we're trying to choose n plus one things from m plus one things, so we've got m old things and a new thing, then either uh, we didn't choose the new thing and we already had m plus one old things, or uh, we chose the new thing, so we only need to choose, uh, sorry, my bad, that's m, n plus one, uh, or we chose the new thing, and we only need to choose n old things. So here I'm counting the paths to here extended by a downward edge, and here I'm counting paths that finish in a red diagonal edge. Except what I want to arrange is for this not to be the arithmetic plus, but for it to be the disjoint union. This is going to be, well, this is actually in a funny way, it's going to turn out to be my favorite, my favorite example category. As remember, you know, years gone by. Roland Backhouse enjoying telling us how um, uh, pre orders are kind of a good proof irrelevant warm up to, to categories. And here uh, I'm going to, uh, to use some structures that have, uh, have some bits in, but are nonetheless still very small and manageable. Uh, it, it's one of those things where if you ever formalize category theory in general in some proof assistant based on type theory, uh, it becomes in general very painful very quickly. So I'm going to work really hard to stay in the world where the objects of the category are boring first order data. And moreover, the morphisms in the categories that I work with today are going to be boring first order data with completely uh, you know, uncontroversial notions of equality. At least in this world of tiny first order stuff, we can do category theory without getting a headache. And that's, uh, uh, you know, nice, nice work if you can get it, and I can. Now, where am I going with all of this? Well, I'll uh, uh, give you the, the headline. I'm going to be looking at binomial coefficients, which represent the choice of a bunch of variables in scope, those variables which are actually in the support of some terms that I'm manipulating. And for that, I'm going to need to know not just how many ways there are to do this, but which way. And that's why it's going to be useful uh, to, to have a type corresponding to binomial coefficients, really representing which ones we chose. That's where we, where we turn right. Just before we leave this picture, there are, of course, loads of fabulous, uh, you know, facts about uh, binomial coefficients. This book is wonderful, and it's it's full of them. Uh, you know, one of the things you notice, by the way, even this equation, which I've written down, tells us in particular that the forward difference of blank choose n plus one is blank choose n. Uh, so that's to say in the calculus of finite differences and summations, the binomial coefficients behave in a spectacularly well-behaved way, which is why they give rise to, I mean, they, you know, again, chunks of this book are about secretly understanding that if you're in the business of doing summations and stuff, switching to binomial coefficients as your polynomial basis is the ace move. But I digress. I do want to observe that every entry, like here, this six, is the sum of everything above it and one 
step to the left. So one plus two plus three gives six. And I don't know, what else have we? Uh, oh, one plus three plus six gives 10 and, and so on. Oh, that's uh, a fact, that's the sort of integral fact that corresponds to this difference equation. But it has a perfectly sensible spatial meaning because it's basically saying that if we got to a place like here, we must have uh, made, there must be one, the, um, one most recent red edge. And where is that coming from? Is it coming from here or here or here? And if so, um, how many ways were there of arriving where that red edge came from? So you can think of it as quantifying over the position of the last one in the bit vector, and then choosing the rest of the ones from the things before that. Uh, so again, there are an awful lot of, uh, of combinatorial facts that are worth mining for their kind of spatial significance and actually bothering about where the bits are uh, by uh, crossing out NAT and, uh, and writing type instead. So that's kind of my game. Uh, what else do I want to talk about? I want to have a short digression relating to uh, numbers. Because uh, I don't know if you've uh, seen my Twitter lately, if you can find it. Um, uh, numbers are a code smell is, uh, is part of the current propaganda. So let's, uh, let's have a think about zipping things together for a moment. So you're uh, yeah. So here's the type of, of zip I'm, I'm going to write made up functional programming languages because it's a whiteboard. Uh, so I'm not going to use specifically Haskell or Agda or anything. Uh, but let's just think, you know, there are lots of ways uh, we could uh, we could implement a function with this type, even if we are abstracting what X and Y are. Uh, we certainly don't even get any kind of guarantee that the uh, uh, of, of what ought to happen when we're in the ragged case where the lists uh, are, um, are of different lengths. And of course, type theorists know how to bore their audiences by fixing that with length index vectors. So you've got vector zip, which goes from vec xn to vec yn to vec x paired with y n. So at least we've dealt with the raggedness, but uh, there are still an awful lot of ways we can implement a function with this type that are not zipping. I mean, for example, there's absolutely nothing stopping us uh, reversing one of our vectors before pairing stuff off. Or, uh, or just making multiple copies of the first thing we find, uh, or whatever it happens to be. This, um, uh, this type isn't really nailing it down. And the reason is because we're using numbers. That's to say, uh, presumably once upon a time, the positions in this vector were in different positions because they were about different things. And when we chose a number to measure the length, we forgot what well, everything that was different about those things. The crucial thing about, uh, well, natural numbers is that they're lists of one. They're lists of, uh, of very boring data that don't get do any work individuating. Uh, so sometimes it might be worth considering uh, not forgetting all of that information. You know, having some clue about the individuals that the position in the data structure are something to do with. I mean, this might be 
especially useful for spreadsheets. But think now about how to, uh, to implement this function. Okay, so all is the predicate transformer, which lists a property of elements, might be a proof relevant property of elements, to a property of lists of those elements. So let's just say we're saying that for everything in the list X's, we have a proof of P. So I'm saying that if I know that uh, all of the X's satisfy P and all of the X's satisfy Q, then I know that all of the X's satisfy the, the predicate conjunction of, of P and Q. And uh, my, uh, uh, my question is now, uh, uh, how many implementations are there of a function with this stuff? Well, because in general, we have no reason to believe that um, uh, a, uh, a proof of P for one of the elements of X's is any use to prove P for any of the other elements of X's, uh, then, you know, this, the fact that we're, in, uh, th that we're choosing predicates over arbitrary stuff rather than just boring elements, the fact that we're bothering to consider the positions in the structure to be pertinent to a distinctive individual means that there is now only one function with this type, namely the Z function that we want. So there's a story here about actually not just counting things, but considering whether there's something of value that individuates them. And correspondingly, I'm uh, going to be uh, working. Uh, uh, that's, that's the first generalization I'm going to make on my um, uh, binomial uh, coefficients is that I'm going to work with lists instead of numbers. Okay, so the idea is that I'm going to write less than or equals, but it's going to be a proof relevant relation on lists. Um, and what am I going to have? I'm going to have that the empty list is embedded in the empty list. And that uh, if uh, theta shows how to embed gamma and delta, then theta zero says how to embed gamma and delta x. I'm using snock lists because they're going to be contexts and contexts grow on the right. So I hope you can cope with lists that grow on the right. Um, and uh, if theta embeds gamma in delta, then theta one embeds gamma x in delta x. So you can see these things really are bit vectors. And at every step, I'm extending the bit vector and extending the list in sync. But what happens at the little end is that I'm carefully collecting only the elements where my selection is uh, chooses a one. Okay, is it uh, is it clear what's going on? But uh, uh, my bit vector is just recording which things in the list on the right that I want to keep in the list on the left. So I can indeed write things like uh, select, which says, uh, if we know that how to embed gamma and delta, and we have all P in delta, then we can get all P in gamma. So we know that P holds for all the things in the delta. We know that the gamma are chosen from the delta. So we can certainly get 
that we know all p's for the gamma. That's to say, these things, selections, act on these vector-like structures uh, to, uh, uh, to select some of the things. And that's something else I want to encourage you to think about is, well, okay, maybe this isn't any old um, uh, indexed set, you know, maybe, maybe this is a category. Maybe this action is, uh, is some sort of functorial action. Maybe we should actually be crossing out type and writing cat. I might as well come out with that explicitly as part of my agenda here. Uh, okay, what else is going to happen? We've got that we know how to select stuff. We've got this notion. I guess uh, I had better check that we get a category. Okay, um, so um, let's think. Um, I can uh, I can define a notion of composition. So if theta shows how gamma is chosen from delta, and phi shows how delta is chosen from psi, then Theta then phi shows how to choose gamma from psi. Okay, uh, so that's the um, declaration. And the trick is basically this, that we're going to substitute the elements of theta for the ones in phi. So what do we have? We've got uh, theta then phi zero is going to be theta then phi zero. Right? Where we see a zero, we don't take anything out of theta. And uh, where we take, where we have phi one, then then we know there must be at least one thing in the middle, so we can ask what happens to it. So that's to say that the, the thinning, the, the selection on the right chooses to keep something, but it's still possible that the thing on the left might throw it away. So this is going to be theta then phi v. And then the other remaining possibility is that there's nothing on the right, in which case there can't have been anything on the left, and we've got the empty, uh, the empty selection. Um, okay, so I claim this is composition. It is performing an action of substitution, so I hope you'll not be terribly surprised if I uh, leave the uh, the proof that this is associative uh, as, uh, as an exercise for the reader. It's also, I hope, clear that the identity for these things is just the bit vector, which is all ones. That just says every, everything is selected. Uh, okay. Now, uh, here's the thing I find working with this thing in, uh, uh, in, Dependently type programming and uh, working with um, uh, working with small categories in particular is that it's an absolute nuisance working with this function. What I want to work with instead is the graph of this function. And uh, I'll give you some more concrete reasons why that is, but it's extremely frustrating 
um, to uh, to write a program in a total programming language, and then have to work to be given uh, its call graph relation and the proof that that call graph relation is functional. Because hang on a minute, uh, I know the call graph uh, is functional because it's the graph of a function in a total programming language. So it's a thing that ought to be for free that the, um, well, the Agdemix is pay for it. I think Cock does a better job of this. Um, you don't often hear me say that. Uh, yeah, so uh, here's a uh, another sort of slight digression. I'm going to sort of start working with diagrams of these things. And I had a, an idea a little while back. Well, I, one of the things that, that troubles me about a categorical diagram, so here we've got Here's gamma, delta, psi. This is theta, phi. Um, one of the things that troubles me is that sometimes we're not very good at making still diagrams. That, you know, when they're not animated or they're not drawn over time, it's sometimes difficult to see what the quantifier alternation is in the diagram. So. Um, uh, I uh, have adopted the convention uh, that um, the diagram appears in phases that have numbers. Um, everything in the even phases, starting with zero, is uh, universally quantified. And everything in the odd phases uh, is um, existentially quantified. And the idea is you know there's one simple rule you label something with its phase if it arrives later than its boundary so here because i've got no phase labels on this picture uh everything arrives at phase zero if i want to say given any such picture i can complete it then i all it it suffices to label this edge with a one, to say, although these two endpoints arrive at phase zero, uh, the, it's the other player who completes the picture by filling in this edge. So that says, whenever these two exist, this can be found. And of course, when I fill in the edge one, I complete the boundary of this triangle. So what I'm saying is that not only does the person at phase one compute um, uh, the composite, but they're also responsible for making the diagram commute. So that's uh, uh, a fun convention, a simple convention for adding uh, quantifier alternation uh, uh, information uh, to, um, uh, to diagrams that sit still. Uh, so if we want to, state associativity with these sorts of pictures, then what do we do? We say, whenever we have a diagram like that, it can be completed like that. So that's to say we can compute the long edge and moreover, the long edge creates two more triangles than we had before. Uh, incidentally, actually, tell you what I'll do just for clarity. I'll do a bit of color as well. Uh, what's my blue pen? Fun fact. There are three equivalent ways to present composition, depending on which two triangles you get to begin with. Right, to present associativity.
always assuming that it's not merely the case that composites exist, but that if someone else produces a candidate for the composite, that it's always possible to show that they're equal. So the point is that phase two adds another thing which makes the diagram commute. And phase three, the person who delivered phase one, the, the original composite shows that this is just a copy of that. Um, so uh, learning lots of stuff, running out of time. Um, okay, uh, what do I wanna say? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at I'm looking at my running order and realizing I'm basically going to have to uh, to delete it. Uh, one thing I was gonna say um, about uh, selections is that um, the, the thing that you find in the library of many um, dependently typed programming languages, uh, you know, fin, fin n, so finite sets, uh, are uh, reasonably at least understood as singleton selections. So if you want, if you're writing down, I don't know, some sort of type of well typed terms, uh, maybe in the simply type lambda calculus, I'm just going to write down the variable case. When do I have a variable which is of type uh, sigma in some scope gamma? Well, one way to do it is to say, well, I've got a selection of singleton sigma from gamma. So that's the same thing as saying sigma is an element of gamma, because this list is of, of length one. So I'm only talking about uh, selecting one element. Um, but uh, uh, why would one bother? Uh, one would bother because this is strictly positive in gamma. It's immediately clear that there is an action You know, if I've got some t in term uh, sigma gamma, and I know why gamma is embedded in delta, then I know how to thin t to get a term over delta. That's exactly going to be, sorry, let me call this phi. That's exactly going to be given by bar theta phi is bar theta phi. Uh, so by actually choosing to realize that, that, that this, is, this is exactly singleton selection, this is saying it's at this point where, where we decide we're going to use a variable that we have to pick one of the variables in scope and discard the rest. It's at this point that we induce uh, an action of um, Thinnings, that's to say, dual, thinnings are dual to selection. So you can think of thinnings as putting some extra stuff in, uh, selection as uh, choosing which stuff is important. Uh, so once again, I'm observing that, uh, uh, that here, uh, when, we observe, when we bother to do positivity checking on things that we know are morphisms in categories, we might discover that some of our favorite uh, indexed data structures are uh, non-trivially functorial uh, in interesting ways. So here that we get, we ought to get uh, an action um, uh, of um, uh, thinnings on terms for free. Of course, we don't because when we are you know, the current state of design of dependently typed programming languages, we're not, we're just noticing when stuff is indexed over things, and we're not looking at what structure the indices have. 
And very often, there's extremely useful categorical structure uh, as there is here. So there's actually something to say here um, that, um, that, yeah, terms are a functor from thinnings as opposed to being merely indexed by scopes. And there's a forgetful map from stuff that's a functor from thinnings to stuff that's merely indexed by scopes. And what we like to do with, well, forgetful functor, what we do with forgetful functors, uh, if we have any, any wit in a world of programming, is to see whether they have a left adjoint. And it turns out that they do. And that's uh, where a whole bunch of new technology comes from. And that's what I really wanted to talk about, but don't have time. I'll, talk, I'll tell you a bit about it. All right. So what I'm gonna do is recast term of some sort in some scope. as relevant term, uh, let's call this RLV to make it not look like relation, term of some sort in, well, uh, let me get this right, spacing wise, if you can tell it's not been enough rehearsal. Right, so a relevant term over a support, actually this, so this tells you uh, what's in scope, but we're going to enforce the property that we, that everything in Delta is gonna get used. So then we sigma up over possible supports and we pair with an embedding of uh, the support into the scope. This is uh, going to give us an alternative nameless syntax. Uh, when we've got, um, uh, when we've when we've got some notion of support and, and our good old binomial coefficients telling us how to choose the things we want. Okay, so now it really is immediate uh, how to um, uh, extend, uh, how to uh, act on terms by further thinnings, because all we have to do is compose them onto this thing. Meanwhile, this thing here really is a we're just indexing over a scope. In fact, you can't, uh, you, we're going to ensure that you can neither uh, extend or throw away anything from Delta. We're going to insist that, that everything in Delta is absolutely necessary. Um, okay, so that's, that's the plan. And, and this, I mean, this is proof relevant, uh, relation composition uh, happens all the time. Lots of people would jump up and down and check matrix multiplication at this point, uh, which is uh, you know, a different sort of summation. Uh, you know, is this an inner product space? Probably. Um, okay. Uh, so um, uh, how am I gonna get there? Um, uh, oh, back one step. Uh, you know, I, I, I said this sort of world of, of, of small things is, is, uh, is wonderful to play with, has no, no problems with the quality, no problems with set size, it's great. There's another thing that's wonderful about it, uh, which is that we can work in the slice category of these things. So if I've got um, 
embeddings that target a particular preferred object. Uh, that's you know, everything that's in scope. And then these are two, what are these things? These are just bit vectors that select a subset. And do you know what we can do with bit vectors of a fixed length, right? Here, fi by, by fixing the thing, by fixing the target, I'm fixing the length of the bit vector. What can we do with bit vectors? We can do good old fashioned Boolean logic. Everything's finite, everything's testable. The law of the excluded middle is no problem at all. You know, it's marvelous just to be in the world of bits, right? Or, you know, bits that, that have structure. So in particular, we can do things like uh, take the, uh, uh, the union of two subsets, that's to say, there's going to be a thing here, there's going to be another arrow in the slice, theta. Uh, so, so theta selects a subset, and then, uh, yeah, the, we need uh, to, to make a, so for this to be a union, I need to know how the, each of the two subsets embeds in the union. So I need final, and phi one that make the diagrams commute. This is fancy disjunction, except recording the bits that explain um, the explanation, you know, that, that say, well, how these things embed in the union, you know, where they end up in this, uh, this set. Uh, so I want the, uh, the minimal, uh, one of these things with no extra slack. Diagrammatically, I'm going to write that like that. So this is, uh, so the, the co-products in the slice category are really your honest to goodness uh, set theoretic union. Uh, it's a great way. Uh, it's a great way to learn category theory because in terms of the Boolean logic, you know exactly what's going on. Um, you know, the, the categorical concepts map on to uh, extremely familiar things. Likewise, the intersection is going to be exactly given by the pullback. Um, and it's going to make some other diagrams commute. Um, and uh, we can even do, but well, here's, here's a fact for you. If somebody gives me theta, selects a bunch of stuff, then it is possible to construct uh, not theta, uh, such that uh, these two uh, cover. So that's, this is basically saying uh, that uh, these two thinnings are exhaustive of this. That's to say that this is minimal. If I say that gamma is minimal covering for theta and not theta, that, then I'm saying uh, that uh, not theta contains at least everything that isn't selected by theta. And then if I take the fullback and insist that the intersection is empty, then I have got exactly the negation um, uh, of theta. That's to say the thing where theta and not theta, so theta or not theta is true, theta and not theta is false. Um, so uh, that's a way to talk about the complement of the selection uh, in terms of, of these two constructions, which in turn enables us to talk about partitioning stuff. There's a marvelous digression that I definitely don't have time to about how to talk about partitions and permutations and maybe say something about the famous catch question, what's a good dependent type for filter? Right.
the answer to what's a good dependent type for filter is don't write filter. Instead, find a partition. But I digress. Uh, where am I at? Um, I should be uh, figuring out how to stop. Um, so, okay, we've been, so, so far we've had sorts. I've been writing sigma for sorts. Some of the time they've been simply typed. So scopes are lists of sorts. Uh, if I want to construct syntax, then uh, I'm interested in saying, what are the constructors for given sorts? So I'm going to say, you, you, just, you just specify the constructors by, for every sort, you got to say, what's, um, what sort of payload you get. So yeah, it's, I'm saying, uh, there's a set of constructors which is indexed over the sort they make and the payload they pack up. And what am I gonna, what are payloads? Well, certainly every sort can be a payload. And um, one is a payload. Well, okay, so it's um, uh, a payload sort is closed under one and product. So that's to say, now we say what these relevant terms are. Relevant terms live in um, payload sort to scope uh, to set, where the deal is that everything in the payload has to um, uh, live in, uh, everything in the scope has to get used in the payload. So we have in particular things like the empty term is relevant of sort one exactly and only for the empty sort. And we have the variable <laughs> is a relevant term uh, of sort sigma in the singleton scope. That's the deal is that if you're going to use a variable, you must have exactly one variable available. And then uh, where was I going? Um, and where do I have space on my board? About here. So if I have, um, if I have a relevant uh, uh, alpha naught, gamma naught, so that's some S naught and some S1 in relevant alpha one, gamma one with theta naught. Am I disappearing off my board? Um, and then we know how to choose gamma naught from gamma and gamma one from gamma. And we have some evidence that theta naught and theta one are exhaustive. Then we construct the relevant pair in alpha naught cross alpha one over gamma. I don't know if that did that just about make it onto the board. Um, right. So what's going on? You can think about it this way. Every time we want to build a pair, uh, we have to say which things get used on the left of the pair and which things get used on the right of the pair. Uh, 
but everything has to be used somewhere. We're not allowed to throw anything away. That's to say, we're enforcing relevance. We should have thrown it away already so that by the time we get to the variables, there's exactly one thing left. By the time we get to the leaves, we've thrown everything away. Okay, so what happens if we want to introduce binding operators, then it's straightforwardly the case that if you want a vacuous binding, you mustn't bring the variable into scope in the first place, but otherwise you can promise to use it. Um, so we get this notion of relevant term, um, and then we recover our general notion of term by saying a term is, you know, we construct a term over scope gamma, first of all, by throwing away all the variables that we're not going to use, and then making damn sure we use the rest. So this is uh, extremely handy if you want to do, I don't know, things like occur checking, uh, or goodness knows uh, what else. Uh, and it certainly gives you a, uh, a representation of uh, syntax with nameless binding, where the weakening operation doesn't involve traversing the term structure at all in the way that's terrible about the Brown notation. Uh, so it just involves composing, do, do, doing this sort of bit vector composition thing here. So uh, if you've got a if you've got a type system that um, uh, that actually makes sure you don't screw up all of these coincidences, then this is a really good fun way to work with with syntax. Uh, if you uh, if you do it in Haskell uh, using uh some unindexed representation of bit vectors then life gets very interesting indeed uh our secret weapon when we do this is to prototype in agda and then port to haskell when we know what we're doing but there we use integers as bit vectors rather than actual kind of inefficient you know, consulate or snuck lists of bit anyway um I wanted to get to one last bit of this picture. Uh, uh, which is uh, that because sorts are closed under uh, uh, under uh, unit and product, uh, we can compute uh, a, uh, so that's to say, so payloads, uh, we can compute um, uh, the, the payload version of a scope. So payload of um, uh, uh, Let's not number them like that. We've got some bunch of, we've got some list of sorts. It's just going to be um, uh, the, um, the product sort of them. So I can define. Uh, relevant substitutions. Gamma to delta as the relevant terms over the payload sort induced by gamma with support delta. What is one of these things? Uh, it's, uh, we have a, for every variable in gamma, we map it to a relevant term. And between them, those relevant terms use everything in delta at least once. And uh, what we end up with uh, is uh, that we get a, um, uh, if we've got some relevant substitution and we've got some thinning, 
that this is some gamma prime, we can complete this Um, so I should haha, label that with a one. Uh, we could complete this to a square that says, if we're only going to keep the images of some of the gamma, then we're only going to need some of the delta in order to be the support of a restricted substitution sigma prime. And once we have this operation, well, uh, this operation, then uh, we can explain how to make relevant substitutions act on relevant terms uh, with the support of the output coming out exactly as we want on the nose. So if we have one of these things and a relevant term over gamma and we let the substitution act on the term, we're gonna get a relevant term with support delta. So that our types of relevant substitutions are actually managing not just what's in scope, but really what's in the support. So the machinery from Pascal's triangle of binomial coefficients is, you know, let me there, you know, right there is exactly what's enabling a whole bunch of really precise work on meta theory where we're managing not just scope, but support. And it's lots of fun. So that's one takeaway. And the other takeaway is that these two dimensional cells are really easy to define inductively. And they're actually uh, do, you know, doing the proofs uh, that manipulate the two cells explicitly and leave the one cells uh, to Agda's unification algorithm is a great way to derive programs from specifications. All the bits are in the one cells and the zero cells. But if we're actually manipulating in our source code, the two cells, we're writing correct programs by, con or rather, we're doing a construction in which Agda is figuring out uh, by unification what the, right, what the right bit vectors are. So it's, um, uh, it's not only uh, you know, lots of fun material, it's directly making use of essentially relational constructions to force the machine to do the right computation. So I hope uh, you uh, uh, enjoy working this way. It really is a, a mathematical program construction. I'll stop there. <laughs>